Welcome back. We're ready to continue our study of 1 Timothy. We're in chapter 3. We have just finished our discussion of the qualities and the characteristics of being an elder or an overseer in the church. And really, I think Paul's main emphasis for these people, these leaders, these overseers, is on their character and their integrity more than their job duty. In fact, we didn't see anything in there that told us exactly what they do. But in choosing these men, and this was so important in the churches in Ephesus because of the doctrinal problems that were coming in, they needed people of integrity. Well, it's time to talk about another level of leadership in the church, deacons. But before we do that, let me use my family as another example. As you know by now, we have four children. And the amazing thing about being the parent of four children is observing how different each of them are from the other. And it's not only that their ages are different, and we have two boys and we have two girls, but the, the gifts and talents that each of them have is very different from the other person. Uh, for example, we have encouraged our children to try a variety of athletic events, sporting events. My wife and I both used to play basketball and enjoyed that very much. And we said, you might like basketball, you might not, but you can try that. They've tried soccer, they've tried um, a variety of different sports, track and field events, and we've tried to get them to try it. Musically, we say, would you try different things? Uh, and it's very interesting as they get older to see how they fit into different categories. For example, our oldest daughter, Michaela, is a good basketball player. She is good in track and field. She's become a very accomplished violinist, beautiful, wonderful violin player and a piano player. Now Landon comes along, he's our second child. He's only two and a half years younger than Michaela, but he is very different from her. He doesn't play the piano or the violin. He found that he loves to play the guitar and the drums. Uh, he, he likes to play basketball and, and American football but honestly, his best event has become track. This year he was in seventh grade and he, he likes to run the longer distances, the 800 meters or the 1600 meters. And the first time he ran the 1600 meters in a competition, he set the school record for seventh graders and they go, you're good at running. You're not so good at this, but you are good at this. Our third trial, Chandler, he plays the violin and he loves basketball. He is like his father. He, he, lo he practices and he plays and we play outside. We have a basketball hoop outside. And so he loves that sport and he's gonna play American football this fall, but he's different from his other brother. Now, Sasha, being eight years old, we don't really know what she's gonna like. We, she's very, she, we've put her in gymnastics. She loves to jump and dance and she's in a dance group. She's, very expressive and very artistic. And if ever music is playing, she's the one who's dancing around the room. You know, maybe Sasha has gifts in those areas. The bottom line is that you don't force every child to do the same thing. You provide them with opportunities and you find out the ways in which God has gifted them and things that they enjoy. And if they enjoy it, hopefully they'll work hard to improve in it. The reason I explain that to you is we've talked about elders and we're now going to talk about deacons and we say, well, if I'm not good enough to be an elder, then I guess I'm not good enough for anything. And you go, oh, you know, church isn't fun anymore. No, 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 no. There are many places and many opportunities in the church to serve. I told you about Corey who was in our church and we said we made him an usher and he did a fantastic job. There are people who have different gifts and different abilities, but what Paul is going to talk to Timothy about now is a level of leadership that is not so much about the doctrinal purity of the church, but about overseeing the servicing of the needs in the church, and we call them deacons. So take your Bibles again with me, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm going to read with you verses 8 through 13 of 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. This is what he says. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. 
Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also a great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So we've talked about deacons, and you probably noticed something in what I read. We said their wives, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Some Bibles say deaconesses. And we'll talk about the difference between those particular words. So don't worry about that right now. But then it ends with this admonition to deacons as well. So if I could give you a bottom line under which all of this fits, Paul would simply say this, I want you to have a healthy church in which people who serve at the level of deacon are also spiritually uh, mature and have a godly character. And you say, Pastor Bruce, that sounds a lot like what you said about elders. That's exactly right. In fact, as I was reading those verses, did you notice how similar the list between the elders and the deacons was the same? Not identical, but very much the same. And this, the other thing that intrigues me about this list, it doesn't talk about their particular duties. Again, it focuses on their character. That if a church is going to be healthy, the character of its leaders he is as important and possibly more important than the actual things that they do. I'm not saying that the things that these people do in their service is not important, not at all. But you can do the right things with a bad character and cause a distraction to the gospel. Whereas if your relationship with the Lord is intact and in, in healthy ways, God can use you in ways that can be blessed beyond what you can even imagine. So he's talking about a healthy churches that use men and women in roles such as these talking about this and their character is such as this. You say, well, where does this notion come from? Where do you get this idea? We get the idea of a problem that was fixed when we go back to the book of Acts. So if you take Keep your finger or a marker in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I want to go back to Acts chapter 6 for just a few minutes. Acts chapter 6 points out a problem in the early church that the apostles had to come in and try to address. It begins this way, Acts chapter 6 verse 1. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So here's essentially what was happening. The widows in the culture of the first century had a horrible time just surviving. That not only were women very socially low in the social scheme of things, if you were a woman and your husband died, your means of support was completely gone. You were at the mercy of your culture or your society or your community to just even survive. So the Christian church begins and people are beginning to get saved and appropriately the church begins to say, hey, these are widows that we can help. And they say, great, we would love to help. But what happened is this, there were the Hebrew widows, but it talks about the Hellenist widows. And what was happening was this, these women who lived in other plates, places outside of Israel were coming back to spend the final years of their life. And as they were coming back, they were saying, well, we have needs too. We need food to eat. We need to have a provision made for us. And somehow between these two groups of women, not all of them were being served well. So this was the problem. Verse 2, and the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And they set before the apostles, and they prayed, and they laid their hands on them. Now look at the effect. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now there's just a couple of things that I want you to notice about what we've just read. The word deacon 
did not appear. You say, well, Pastor Bruce, if, if you're going to say that this is where deacons come from, the word isn't even used. Well, we believe that this is the seeds of the idea that eventually led to the title and the description of deacon. And there's something very intriguing about what the apostles did. I don't know if you noticed it, but in verse 2, they summoned the disciples together and they said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the Word of God to serve tables. And there's part of me that said, are you saying you're too good to serve these women? That's not what they were saying at all. You see, what I have a problem with is saying no. If somebody comes to me in, in our church and says, Pastor Bruce, um, I, I need to talk to you for a minute about this. Could you help me with this? Or if somebody says, you know, I'm having this particular problem, could you help me with this? And I'll say, yeah, I can help you with that. And, and, and that's a good thing. But what these apostles recognized was that their primary calling was the study of and the proclamation of the gospel and the word of God. And they had the wisdom to say, there is a very real need in our church, but we must continue to teach and preach. Therefore, we will find men who can do this role in the church. And they looked for men with character and maturity, and the Holy Spirit was in them. And the effect was that the teaching continued to be great, and service of the needs happened, both. Now, I raise that because so many times, a very few amount of people try to do all of the work. They don't want to, but in our church, they, they have a statistic in America that I'm not true that's here. They say it this way, that 80% of the work of the church is done by 20% of the people. In fact, I heard recently that the statistic is even changing where they say 90% of the work is being done by 10% of the people. That's not healthy that the church is supposed to be the hands and the feet and the different organs all serving together in, in ways in which they can be served. And I just love the, effect, the fact that these apostles had the wisdom to say, we can't do everything, we know what we're supposed to do, and we're going to find godly people to serve in these roles of service. And I just think that is fantastic. As I've gotten older, I'm coming to understand myself and my gifts better. I wish that I had learned this more in my 20s and I didn't have to learn it now in my late 40s. But honestly, and, and I was reading this in a book or I heard this from a speaker, he said, I want you to think about this. Most of us are really only good at one or two things, but we do many more things than that. And I thought, that's true. God has made me a teacher. I'm not saying that I'm particularly good at, but I love it. It, it. it feels like that's what I was born to do. But when I fill my plate with so many things to do, and it takes me in distraction from teaching the Word of God, then I no longer become an effective teacher. So we need in our churches men who will come along and women who will come along and say, you know what, I can't be a teacher or a preacher like you, Pastor Bruce but I love to help serve the needs of people. And I say, thank you, Lord, that together we are accomplishing the mission that God has given for us. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account
account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.